At Ethel's party that St. Patrick's Day, Jackie seemed to go out of her way to ignore her hostess. While the gregarious Ethel entertained, the aloof Jackie spent most of the cocktail hour alone, warming herself in front of the blazing living room fireplace. The house was always cold in winter because Bobby wanted to save on heating bills. Jackie wasn't just being aloof, recalled one of the guests. She was taking all the heat to warm herself, and by standing in front of the fireplace, she became the center of attention, which is very typical of Jackie. A few of the guests also noted that Jack was hardly paying attention to Jackie, and vice versa, which seemed odd at a time when the two were believed to be seriously in love and talking marriage. When the butler came into the living room and announced that dinner was being served, there was a sudden commotion in the corner of the room. Suddenly, Bobby retrieved Jackie's fur coat from a closet and put it over her shoulders. Moments later, Ethel and Bobby saw Jackie to the door, and she abruptly left. Ethel came back into the house, and she was livid. Davy Hackett and Lem Billings were trying hard to lift her spirits, but everyone was stunned by Jackie's performance. Hello, how are you? Welcome to my channel. My name is Cheer Denise. We are going to keep going in The Other Mrs. Kennedy, and we're still in the part entitled Bobby's Wife. If you enjoyed last episode, which I dearly loved last episode because we had finally gotten into some of that Skagel drama. You know, the Skagels and the Kennedys, they are not meshing whatsoever. Both of them are very rich families, but both of them deal with their wealth and their power and their prestige very differently. That episode was amazing. This episode is equally good. And this time we're finally meeting Jacqueline Bouvier. And Jacqueline and Ethel do not get along. They are as different as night and day. And Ethel is kind of mean to Jackie. I mean... Jackie seems like she was a little bit hard to get along with because she was just so very, like, touchy and, you know, things made her cry easily and things like that. But Ethel kind of went out of her way to be kind of a jerk. So that's interesting. Um, but we have lots to get to. That's our last chapter today. So stay in until the very last chapter because, you know, that I, I've i known that that relationship wasn't great, but just reading about the way that they rubbed each other the wrong way, they are just like sandpaper against skin. So get ready. Okay, this is chapter 42. It's entitled Lake Avenue in the 50s. I just love this Gagel family. I mean, I don't like love them like I'd want to be one of them, but the drama, the crazy, it's so good. Jim Skakel was 29 when he started dating beautiful 19-year-old Virginia Wyman, a Methodist from Catersville, Georgia. Virginia's aunt, Frances Loro, and her husband Horatio Loro, a well-known horse trainer, had met Jim at Hylia Racetrack, where he was a regular, and were impressed with the tall, handsome young man. They told Virginia, he's got a great family, they're a bunch of fun, they're off the wall, you're going to love them. A blind date was arranged, and soon the two were going together. But whenever Virginia asked Jim about his family, he remained mum. I'd say to Jim, what are they like? And he'd say, I don't want to talk about him. And I'd say, well, if we ever have children, were they going to look like monkeys? And Jim would say, maybe so. He never once discussed his parents, Great Lakes Carbon, the mansion in Greenwich, or the fact that he had a sister named Ethel, who was married to a Kennedy. It was all very odd. After months of subtle pressure from Virginia, Jim finally invited her for a weekend at Lake Avenue to meet his family. They were greeted at the front door by Big Anne, who said hello and thrust a gift-wrapped book into the young woman's hands, and it was a copy of Dr. Norman Vincent Peale's How to Improve Your Personality. So, the message is real clear. Get the hell out. Virginia saw the writing on the wall and cut short her visit to Greenwich. They were loud and boisterous and they all just ignored me, she recalled of the visit. Ethel and Bobby were at the first dinner and didn't say one word to me. I knew I could not break the wall they built around themselves. Took 10 to 15 years alone just to get to know them. They're so private, so secretive. Despite being a problem child, Jim had always remained Big Anne's favorite son. And over the years, she had done everything in her power to keep him out of the clutches of the many women who had pursued him. When young women came to the house, Big Anne would instruct them to freshen up in one of the bathrooms. And when they'd come out, she'd make up a story that Jim had to leave. She'd tell Jim the same thing about the girls. Many of Jim's blossoming romances were aborted by Began in that fashion. He was her heart. She didn't ever want to lose him, Virginia said years later. One evening during dinner at the Huntington Hotel in Pasadena, Jimmy showed up a half hour late with his suit and tie messed up and dirty and drunker than a hoot owl, recalled Great Lakes Carbon executive Jay Mayhew. Mrs. Cagle was putting her arms around Jimmy and kissing him and making excuses for him and saying, Oh, Jimmy, darling, what have you been doing? I looked at George and I could tell he was disgusted as hell with Jim, but he just shook his head. Jim was Mrs. Cagle's favorite. I never saw any type of that affection from her toward any of her other children. 
Despite Jim's behavior, George Skakel felt he was the brightest of his three sons and hoped that one day he would take over the company. On one occasion in the early 1950s, the senior Skakel summoned Great Lakes Carbon attorney Tom Hayes into his office, confided that, my own son won't talk to me, and instructed the lawyer to get Jim back. Hayes gathered that Jim was angry at his father for devoting all of his time to building Great Lakes Carbon and not enough with him when he was growing up. Hayes met with Jim several times at one of Jim's hangouts, the Ritz Bar in Manhattan. There was some softening, and they eventually talked together, Hayes said later. But Jim would never have much to do with Great Lakes Carbon, at least while his father was alive. Not only had Jim now decided to get married, but he'd chosen a girl who wasn't a Catholic, which drove Big Ann up the wall. In the Skakel family, Virginia observed, there were two things that were important, Jesus Christ and the Great Lakes Carbon. Jim and Virginia were married at her grandmother's house in Miami on May 24, 1952. Big Ann and all the Skakels never got off their knees the whole time during the ceremony, recalled Virginia Skakel, laughing about the grotesque affair years later. Mrs. Skakel and I were the only non-Catholics there, except for Pat, who remained in Ireland, and Georgianne, who was expecting Alexandria at any moment. All the Skakels attended. Ethel, pregnant, was there without Bobby. At the reception, Big Ann got into an argument with Virginia's aunt, Knowing that the woman had been married three times, Big Ann declared, I will never ask you into my house. I don't condone divorce. Mrs. Laura, shocked by Big Ann's outburst, looked her up and down and said, I doubt I would have come anyway. Remembering that scene years later, Virginia said, My aunt could not believe those people. When the party was over, my grandmother said to me, Jesus, we'll probably see you in a month. You'll be back soon. There were bets on how long Jim and I would last. After their European honeymoon, Jim and Virginia moved into the boyhood home on the third floor of the Lake Avenue house. What's up with all these young people getting married and going back home? Y'all gotta get your own house, please. It's not like there's not enough money around. Y'all all probably have trust funds. And mom and daddy'd buy you a house. Find one, ask them to pay for it, and then move out. Because this business about living under the roof of your mother-in-law cannot stand. Anyway, a few days later, Big Ann, on her daily inspection of the house... Oh, so she's worried about how the house looks now, is she? marched into Jim and Virginia's assigned bathroom and stopped dead in her tracks. Virginia Skakel, we have got to talk now. When Big Ann found her cowering daughter-in-law, she thundered, This is not allowed in my house. I want it out of here. The item in question was a douchebag. The rigid Catholic environment at Lake Avenue persisted in the early 1950s. Big Ann continued to maintain strict rules governing anything of a sexual nature. None of the Skakel girls or any female guest were permitted to wear slacks in the house. Only dresses were sanctioned. Shorts were allowed for athletic activity. Tight bathing suits were banned. At breakfast, the women had to be in dress clothes. No pajamas, robes, or nightgowns were permitted. The Skakels never spoke of it, Virginia said later. Sex sex never existed. It's taboo. Big Ann also demanded that Virginia convert to Catholicism and enrolled her in classes at Ethel's alma mater, Manhattanville. Can you imagine? I mean... <laughs> Excuse me, lady, I have things to do. You can't just enroll me in classes at Ethel's old college. Are you kidding me? Eventually, Jim and Skagel separated. <laughs> what a big shock. Uh, and they subsequently divorced. But the two would remarry and have a family, but only after Big Ann had joined her maker. Can you imagine having a mother-in-law so terribly bad that it ripped up you and your significant other apart? And then finally, when she died, you guys were able to come back together and have kids. <laughs> Big Ann needs to get her fat hands out of people's lives. Well, unfortunately, Big Ann's not dead yet. She's still around, and she's still spending money. Big Ann read hundreds of books on fine antiques and hired renowned interior decorators like Elsie DeWolf and Billy Baldwin to educate her. She also attended lectures at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Would that she had been a student of her own child. Would that she had cared a whit about her children the way she does about antiques and fine interior decorators. Anyway, Big Ann's taste was perfect, observed Mary Begley, but all very guided. At Lake Avenue, Big Ann had her Venetian room, with Venetian furnishings and paintings, and her orange room, decorated with French provincial pieces. It was absolutely unreal, said a family friend. Beautiful, in perfect taste. But it wasn't like a museum, in spite of it all. She did a remarkable job. In the 1950s, she paid $50,000 for one antique music stand, so she had better have known what she was doing. Bing Ann was also infatuated with decoupage and retained a noted artist of the medium, Mabel Manning, to decorate the grand piano, the dining room table, and Ethel's room, which was maintained intact even though she was long gone. <laughs> okay, that is a different time. Don't come near my grand piano with decoupage, but okay. It's 
crazy that she would care this much about the furnishings in her house and then just be so flippant with them. $50,000 for a music stand, one single music stand to complete the look in a certain room. And then she's handing out cans of ginger ale and being like, let's all squirt each other in the face. What is this wild life? I mean, I can't even conceive of that amount of money where I could just be so reckless with it. And I would care because I, I think what I can't piece together is caring this much about the furnishings in my house and then wrecking them. Because like all of my work and acquiring this perfection, it all comes to naught when you decide to spray it all down with ginger ale. Well, nothing thrilled Big Ann more than when she could get some bargain prices for these antiques. The book says that Big Ann was thrilled when through her shrewd bargaining or expert knowledge, she was able to buy a fine antique at a flea market price. Once on an antiquing expedition through New England, she came upon a shop in Boston whose entire contents she wanted. After dickering over the price with the owners for hours, she finally wore him down. He agreed to ship it all the following week, cash on delivery. George Skakel Sr. was all too aware of his wife's obsession with antiques. But for the most part, he looked the other way, as he did with her intense Catholicism, viewing both interests as innocent, if somewhat annoying. Every so often, he'd take devilish pleasure in playing a practical joke. Big Ann happened to be out the day the antique-laden truck from Boston pulled up to Lake Avenue. Hey, Mac! asked the driver. Where should I unload this stuff? Skakel, who was working in the garden in his old clothes, ambled over to the truck. You been paid yet? He asked the driver, making himself sound like one of the hired help. When the driver responded that he was supposed to pick up a check, George Skakel cackled. Well, I'll tell you, he said, wiping his brow. I've worked for these here Skakels for 20 years, and I still ain't seen a dime yet. With that, the driver got back in the truck and drove off with Big Ann's beloved bargain antiques, leaving George laughing hysterically. Big Ann was furious. When she wasn't redecorating, Big Ann kept up with her neighbors by subscribing to every house tour in the area. She got a kick out of seeing how other people did their places, said Mary Begley. Big Ann's favorite was Rusk Rehabilitation Garden Tour, sponsored by the Gimbel family, who always got the owners of the most spectacular houses in Greenwich to open their doors. Lunch was held in a tent on the grounds of Chieftains, the Gimbel's magnificent Greenwich estate. Big Ann, who tried to keep the grounds of Lake Avenue pristine, had a group of men working for her, whom she called the Road Gang local laborers whom she periodically checked on throughout the day to ensure that they were earning their keep, making the rounds of her estate in a surplus army jeep. Big and beefy, she resembled a prison matron overseeing a work detail. The road gang tended the grounds and began its full-sized commercial nursery, located not far from the house. Mrs. Skakel had business stationery made up for the nursery to enable her to purchase all the plants, shrubs, flowers, and related supplies at wholesale prices. She used to buy out whole stores, said a Skakel family member. She'd find a business that was in trouble. Dry goods store, baby clothing store, jewelry store. And she'd buy all the stock. I don't know what the hell she did with all that stuff. It was weird now that I think about it. But we were all amused. It was just one of Big Ann's pastimes. Instead of playing golf or tennis, she was out buying in the contents of stores. What a strange life. One Christmas, Big Ann went to a toy shop on Manhattan's Upper East Side to shop for presents for her growing contingent of grandchildren and the offspring of friends and relatives. As the store manager listened solemnly, Big Ann brazenly described in detail her orphanage for poor Catholic children that she ran, emphasizing the fact that the kids would have to go without toys that holiday season unless someone opened his heart. I'll buy most of everything in here, she said meekly, if you'll just only give me a price break. She put on such an act that the shopkeeper's eyes clouded up. I started to crack up recalled Virginia Skakel, who had accompanied her, and she whispered to me not to laugh and not to open my mouth, but she got away with it. She was incredible. See, this is the thing that's real annoying to me about Big Ann. She cares so much about being a Catholic. She's over there willing to insult people and being like, you've had three divorces, get out of here, I wouldn't invite you to my house. But then she's over here making a practice of lying to people to get discounts. Does that Ten Commandment not apply, Anne? Are you allowed to just lie whenever the spirit moves? Like, what are you talking about, Anne? Making everybody feel bad if they can't follow the letter of the Catholic law, but you're over here making all kinds of exemptions for the way you treat people. When Virginia came to their house and she handed Virginia that book that was like, fix your personality, was that the way we were called to treat each other? Is that how you would like someone to do unto you, Big Anne? All of these people are just such fakes. It's just... just just hypocrites, all of them. The Kennedys are hypocrites, and Big Ann in her way is a, is a hypocrite. You know, maybe she's not running around and sleeping with people on the side, but she looks at all of her little white lies and, you know, making up stationery for this or lying to this guy over here to get free stuff or, a, you know, a hearty discount. 
all of that's just white lies. It's all just okay. It's just part of going through life. Get what you want. Uh, I think that that's still not what we're supposed to be doing. Isn't a white lie, a, a white lie and, 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 and conning people to get what you want. is exactly the same. It, it's the same color as somebody having an affair, sleeping with somebody to get what you want. You know, you're married, but you're going to fool around on the side because there's something you need from this other person. And begins over here lying because there's something she needs from that person. And you could say, okay, well, it's not the same. It doesn't hurt the same amount of people. Okay, fine. But it's the same color. It's the same color. It's just a different hue. I'm just sick of Big Ann sitting around in her self-righteous ways, acting like she's so much better than everybody else. But she's over here lying six ways to Sunday. Anyway, um, chapter 43, Washington bound. Back to Ethel. Now that Jack had a job as a U.S. senator for the next six years, Bobby needed one too. So he once again turned to his father for help. If it weren't for Joe Kennedy, Bobby would have had nothing. But a month after the election, in December 1952, Joe Kennedy telephoned Joe McCarthy, who just won re-election. It was only natural that the senior Kennedy would go to his demagogue friend for help. During the recent campaign, the two men had had some mutual beneficial dealings. As a longtime supporter of McCarthy's tactics and philosophies, Kennedy had discreetly offered the senator's strategy and advice, and quietly contributed a substantial sum to McCarthy's coffers. McCarthy returned the favor by selling his own Republican Party in Massachusetts down the Charles River at Kennedy's behest. Kennedy was well aware that Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. would get an enormous boost from having the immensely popular Irish Catholic McCarthy visit Boston and give Lodge his endorsement. To avoid that, Kennedy offered McCarthy a handsome contribution in exchange for staying out of Beantown. It worked. Now that the Republicans had won the White House and captured the Senate, McCarthy was made chairman of the powerful Permanent Cub Committee on Investigations of the Senate Government Operations Committee, dubbed the McCarthy Committee. Who better to put on the committee's payroll than Bobby, an ambitious young man with a law degree and the influential family name? Also, Bobby and Ethel were fervent supporters of McCarthyism, Joe Kennedy pointed out. Soon the committee would stage Capitol Hill's most disturbing and dramatic spectaculars ever, the Army McCarthy hearings. If he got the job, Bobby would have instant fame, be on the front pages every day. At 27, Bobby desperately wanted the post. He also appeared to have a real feel for the sort of thing McCarthy was doing. During the Kennedy Lodge race, for instance, Bobby had ordered the publication of a study purporting that Lodge was, as young Kennedy put it, soft on communism. Bobby also frequently maintained that hunting down suspected red was, quote, an important domestic issue. He was McCarthy's kind of man. But it turned out Joe Kennedy had put in Bobby's bid for the job a bit too late. McCarthy had privately decided to hire another young lawyer who'd recently made quite a reputation for himself for having a brilliant legal mind and a taste for blood. Roy Marcus Cohen, 25, had made his mark as a savvy, hard-nosed prosecutor by helping to send convicted spies Julius and Ethel Rosenberg to the electric chair. Now working for the Attorney General in Washington, Cohen, a closeted homosexual, and a Jew with anti-Semitic leanings, was McCarthy's first choice. The day Joe Kennedy telephoned McCarthy, Roy Cohen happened to be in the senator's office. As Kennedy employed the senator to give Bobby the job, McCarthy handed a note to Cohen. Remind me to check the size of his campaign contribution. I'm not sure it's worth it. Had McCarthy not already made up his mind about Cohen, it might have been a toss-up between the two young knights. Both the boyish Kennedy and the darkly sinister Cohen were equally arrogant and ruthless. They also shared the same Democratic Party affiliation, which didn't seem to bother the Republican McCarthy one bit, as long as they played his game. Beyond his fondness for Cohen, McCarthy felt that Bobby lacked experience for the job. At the same time, the senator coming under intense scrutiny from the media, moderates, and the left, feared that such a Kennedy appointment would look like a political payoff. McCarthy offered an alternative plan. He'd hire Bobby as an assistant to Committee General Counsel Francis D. Flanagan, a former FBI agent. Later, Bobby would move up as he gained experience. The arrangement also allowed Bobby to report directly to McCarthy and not Cohen, whom Bobby already despised. Joe Kennedy telephoned his son and advised him to take the senator's offer. Bobby reluctantly agreed. Luckily, Bobby and Ethel didn't have to live off of his starting salary, $95.25 a week. It's a pittance. How can anybody live off of that? Chapter 44, First Home. Finally, we're only like three kids in at this point, and finally they find themselves a house. Actually, I don't know how many kids they have. I'll have to be reminded. I think the last time we read, they'd had two so far. In January 1953, Ethel, Bobby, and their babies, Kathleen and Joe, moved to Washington. Ethel was delighted. 
For the first time in their two and a half years of marriage, they'd finally have a permanent home and a life somewhat removed from the influences of Lake Avenue and Hyannisport. Bobby was pleased too, excited about the prospects of independence, making a name for himself, and of forging a close political alliance with his brother, whom he would now see on a daily basis. But in typical Kennedy fashion, he was adamant to Ethel that the rent at their new home be reasonable and that the house be in Georgetown, where Jack lived. Bobby gave Ethel a rent budget of $500 a month, a respectable sum to most people in the early 50s, but peanuts to someone with Ethel's extravagant habits. Ethel still had a difficult time understanding the Kennedy's penny-pinching mentality. Still, she knew she'd have to be more prudent if she wanted to keep Rose and Bobby off her back. One of her cutbacks that year was not giving her mother a Christmas present. Mrs. Skakel was in high dungeon because Ethel had had the gall to tell her she couldn't afford a present, called Mary Begley. Big Anne went into a complete rage. I remember her saying, Ethel damned well better give me something. She felt her daughter was getting more like the Kennedys every minute. But it's not Ethel's fault that she can't give her mother a present. These people will tell her. These people, these people will not allow her to spend any money. And yes, I understand. Ethel's over there spending like there's no tomorrow. So I understand why they had to put some kind of rain on the spending. I mean, you're not going to stay rich if you spend like that. But at the same time, is Ethel to be blamed for the fact that she doesn't, she's not given the pocket money in order to buy her mother a present? How in the world can Mrs. Giggle be so mad? Mrs. Giggle could buy herself anything she wanted. She doesn't need Ethel's Christmas present. Can't she at least sympathize with the fact that her daughter is now, you know, in a different environment? Seems to me, if I were Big Anne, and spending was like my favorite thing in the world, all I'd have is compassion for my daughter who no, could no longer spend that way. And I wouldn't rain down hate on her head because she couldn't buy me a present. In my mind, I'd be like, oh my goodness, you have really come on hard times if you can't even afford to get your poor mother a present. Anyway, at first, Bobby, Ethel, and the kids moved into a residential hotel while Ethel house hunted. She finally found one of the few detached houses in Georgetown, a charming furnished four-bedroom on S Street, footsteps from the entrance to the majestic grounds of Dumbarton Oaks. She charmed the owner into dropping his rent, which brought the monthly payment in line with Bobby's budget. Ethel was ecstatic. She finally had her own home. But there were times during that period when she was filled with self-doubt. Was she bright and savvy enough to handle the political life? At one point, she sought her brother Jim's counsel. He was not one to mince words. You're married to a Democrat to so behave like a Democrat, he told her. Whatever your husband says, that's it. You're not there to think. Jim Skakel felt that by marrying Bobby, Ethel had taken the Kennedy loyalty oath, and that was it. The normally gregarious Ethel was cautious when it came to making new friends. Said one close friend who eventually fell out of favor after devoting years to Ethel. She wanted a return for her investment of time in a person. And she wouldn't welcome you officially until Bobby gave her the okay. She demanded style loyalty. She only admitted people who are amusing, funny, bright. She always had semi-glamour girls as her friends. Blonde and blue-eyed, cute and perky, all American good looks. She liked that type, and she had them around because Bobby wanted them there too. You can only wonder why. One of her buddies in Washington was Sarah Davis, cute, kicky, and creative, who had dropped out of Beddington College in her freshman year to marry handsome Princeton graduate Spencer Davis, a former naval officer who had started to make his way as an investment broker. On the recommendation of a mutual friend, Sarah threw a small dinner party for Ethel and Bobby, and the two women hit it off instantly. But their relationship wasn't firmly bonded until the following weekend, when Sarah, at Ethel's invitation, joined the gang to play touch football in Georgetown. Sarah amazed Ethel and Bobby with her prowess on the field. Unlike Jackie, who once asked Kennedy friend Ted Sorensen, When I get the ball, which way do I run? Sarah could throw and catch, and didn't mind roughing it up with the guys. Ethel and Sarah's friendship was finally cemented when Sarah got a charley horse in one of her legs but continued to play, showing the kind of spunk that Bobby and his family appreciated and expected. The two young women became virtually inseparable, lunching and shopping together and talking on the phone for hours. Because of Sarah's flair for fashion and design, she became a valuable asset to Ethel, who constantly consulted her. They were like ham and eggs, said a mutual friend. But by the early 1970s, Ethel and Sarah's relationship came to an end. Later, Davis told a confidant, my friendship with Ethel was a painful part of my life, and I don't even want to think about it. What does that mean? More than a few of Ethel's friends would fall by the wayside as Ethel's power grew and her taste changed. The path to Ethel's door would eventually be littered with the victims of her quirky and erratic personality and Bobby's controlling influence. 
During those early days in Washington, Ethel's ebullience and euphoria manifested themselves in a determination to live as grandly as she could within the financial constraints that Bobby and Rose were forever mandating. Inevitably, Ethel violated the limits almost as soon as they were placed on her. She immediately hired a staff of servants who wore a different colored uniform each day of the week. Ethel also became a familiar face at the many antique shops in Georgetown, and the antique shows, such as the one at the Shoreham Hotel, where dealers remembered her spending freely. Like her mother, Ethel had developed a passion for antiques and became an expert at bargaining. But see, this is the thing, Ethel. You just bought a fully furnished house. What are you doing with all these antiques? And you know, my patience for Ethel and her spending, I'm, you know, I've, I've eaten up all that patience that I have. I understand at the beginning that it would have been hard to curb, but you've had two and a half years now of your husband and your mother-in-law barking at you about your spending habits. At what point are you out of self-preservation going to go, I think I better stop spending like this. You don't have that money anymore. It's not available to you. It must not be because the family's freaking out about her spending. It, it doesn't seem like her family is giving her this, you know, lifeline of spending. However, you know, if your husband can't take care of you in the way that you're accustomed, we'll just hand you the cash you want. That doesn't seem to be what's happening here because Bobby keeps saying, you're spending all my money. You're spending all my money. So does he, like, I don't understand. I don't understand the way the finances are working here. Is it that she is receiving money from her family, but because they're married, he, you know, looks at that as their money, not her money. And so he doesn't want them, you know, to lose all this money that her family's shoveling her away. Or has her family been like, you're married now. He takes care of things. I feel like that's the way it is. Um, just based on other things we've read, it doesn't seem like she's got some kind of trust fund or some kind of money in a bank account somewhere that she's allowed to spend that's from her family. I don't know. But see, it's like, how can you just sort of spit in your husband's face like this? He's already said we don't have the money. But then you're over here hiring a bunch of staff, servants, and they all have these different outfits that they're wearing every day. Like, how big is your house that you need servants in it? You know, it's just a, if you have 500 a month, even in 1950s, your house can't be that big that you would need a staff of servants. So what are you just tripping all over the servants and the kids and the toys and the dog and all this? I mean, it's just like, get these people out of here. There's not enough room for everybody. Anyway, she's over here just spending, spending, spending. And uh, the book says, Ethel had what I'd call wasp good taste, said a friend. She never really cared about antiques. She wasn't that intellectual. But she had this incredible ability to pick up just a smatter of knowledge here and there and then make you think she was an expert. Ethel was always alert for an interesting find. While getting her hair done at Elizabeth Arden's, she fell in love with a French antique bench with pink brocade that was a part of her furnishings, and she decided that she had to have it. Ethel befriended the decorator, Catherine Boots Treat, emphasizing that she was a Kennedy and got the bench. As time passed, Ethel would often use the Kennedy name with merchants and vendors to get things at wholesale, at cost, or even for free. In New York, she'd make the rounds of her favorite antique and interior decorating shops. The bills would come in and Bobby would be livid. At Janssen, for example, Ethel was late in paying for thousands of dollars of merchandise. Among Sarah Davis's talents was painting, and Ethel had commandeered one or two of her friend's canvases to hang on her walls. After a couple of years, Sarah, who was not in the Kennedy's Financial League, sent a modest bill to Ethel for her works. But when Bobby came across the invoice, he hit the ceiling. What do we owe Sarah Davis $250 for? He demanded. And Ethel quietly explained that it was for the wonderful picture that he'd always admired that hung in the dining room. Bobby smirked. <laughs> Sarah never got paid, said a mutual pal. Ethel never fought Bobby over such matters, even if it meant hurting a friend. A friend of Ethel's was a real estate agent and had heard of a property that she thought Ethel and Bobby might be interested in buying. The friend mentioned the house to Ethel, but instead of going through Ethel's chum, Bobby called the sellers on his own in hopes of avoiding paying the agent's commission. When the friend complained to Ethel, Bobby got on the phone. He really let her have it, recalled the principal. Bobby yelled, This whole time, you've only been after us for our money! The friend was so upset that when Bobby hung up, she ran to her room in tears. Ethel loved simple, elegant, expensive sportswear that showed off her slim athletic figure. When she couldn't find what she wanted in Washington, in those days there's only a few interesting specialty shops, she'd zip up to New York with one of her pals. At Bergdorf's, Ethel hit the shoe department like the Marines at Guadalcanal, buying expensive Delman shoes in every color, recalled one of her shopping companions. She'd buy five of everything, ten of everything. Ethel was very acquisitive, and she'd get hell from Bobby for it. He couldn't understand why she had to have six of something. Bobby began asking Ethel's friends, Do you spend like she does? How do you manage? 
Finally frustrated, he ordered Ethel to have all the bills sent directly to the Park Agency, the Kennedy Family Business Office, at 230 Park Avenue. While Rose was critical of Ethel's spending habits generally, she thoroughly supported her daughter-in-law's desire to look attractive. In fact, it was Rose herself who told Ethel that Joe always liked women in good-looking clothes, and that he complimented her when she wore a particularly stunning dress. She advised Ethel to do the same, leaving it understood that all the Kennedy men were notorious womanizers like their father, and that the Kennedy women should do everything in their power to make themselves alluring to their husbands. Now, here comes the last chapter, the one I told you about at the top of the hour. Ethel and Jackie. Yes, yes. That other Kennedy wife who's dealing with the womanizing of her Kennedy man. Let's see how they get along, and it's not well. Not long after, settling into her new home, Ethel began throwing dinner parties, attempting to establish a reputation as a popular hostess. Ethel's first Washington soiree, taking place not long after she and Bobby moved to Georgetown, was in honor of St. Patrick, except that Ethel's curious telephone invitation instructed the female guest to wear black, not green. Jack had asked Ethel to invite the new woman in his life, Jacqueline Bouvier, whom the junior senator from Massachusetts had recently taken to Ike's inaugural ball. Ethel's party was the first occasion for the future sister-in-laws to meet, and it would turn out to be a far from auspicious introduction. It was a cold March evening, with ice and snow still on the ground from a recent late winter storm. Jack, whose chronic back condition was acting up, was in a great deal of pain that night. He had arrived early, alone, and was limping around on crutches, wearing old bedroom slippers, drinking with the other guests. Kennedy, hanger-on, Lem Billings, Bobby, boarding school chum, Dave Hackett, Jim Buckley, a future U.S. senator from New York, who would eventually marry Anne Cooley, who had gone to Manhattanville with Ethel, and Anne-Marie O'Hagan Murphy, among others. Jackie was one of the last to arrive, pulling up dramatically in a chauffeured rolls. As was her style, she made a stunning entrance. Like all the other women at the party, she had obediently followed Ethel's directive to dress in black. There was only one exception to Ethel's mandate, Ethel herself. She swooped into the party, a mischievous smile on her face, wearing, as Anne-Marie O'Hagan Murphy recalled, the most gorgeous chiffon dress, layer upon layer upon layer, of all shades of green. Now that was typical of Ethel. No one was allowed to wear green, we were told, but there she was, shimmering like an emerald. In coming years, Ethel would use such gimmicks to earn a reputation as an offbeat hostess. Invitations to her parties were in demand because guests never knew what to expect. At Ethel's party that St. Patrick's Day, Jackie seemed to go out of her way to ignore her hostess. While the gregarious Ethel entertained, the aloof Jackie spent most of the cocktail hour alone, warming herself in front of the blazing living room fireplace. The house was always cold in winter because Bobby wanted to save on heating bills. Jackie wasn't just being aloof, recalled one of the guests. She was taking all the heat to warm herself, and by standing in front of the fireplace, she became the center of attention, which is very typical of Jackie. A few of the guests also noted that Jack was hardly paying attention to Jackie, and vice versa, which seemed odd at a time when the two were believed to be seriously in love and talking marriage. When the butler came into the living room and announced that dinner was being served, there was a sudden commotion in the corner of the room. Suddenly, Bobby retrieved Jackie's fur coat from a closet and put it over her shoulders. Moments later, Ethel and Bobby saw Jackie to the door, and she abruptly left. Ethel came back into the house, and she was livid, recalled Anne Marie O'Hagan Murphy. Jackie had accepted her invitation to come for drinks and dinner, and then suddenly said something had come up and she'd have to leave. Ethel was furious, because a beautiful dinner had been prepared, and the table had been set for the right number of people, and now one of them was missing. Ethel felt that the whole dinner party was ruined by Jackie. Davy Hackett and Lem Billings were trying hard to lift her spirits, but everyone was stunned by Jackie's performance. That is rude. What a rude way to behave. And see, that's what I don't understand. All these people have been taught better. Jackie had been taught better than to act like that. To come to a party, not talk to anybody, take up all the heat and then leave before dinner starts. That's rude. Don't bother coming. If you don't want to come and behave and be a part of the party, then don't come. Don't come and ruin it with your self-centeredness and everybody look at me and I'm going to take up all the heat and I'm going to leave and make a commotion and you know everyone. the party will be ruined because I didn't stay. I mean, honestly, the party shouldn't be ruined because one person didn't stay. Who cares? So they, you know, if they don't want to come, then go. You know, we'll have a good time without you. We don't need you. But that's not the way things work. It is ruined because you are thoughtless and all you cared about was yourself and making a big splashing interest and then a big splashing leave. It's rude. It's also rude that Ethel told everybody else what to wear and then she got to be the star of the show. But, you know, it is her party, so whatever. But Jackie, really, like, is that the way we want to behave? Why would you act like that? What would the joy be? What would the joy be in coming and ruining somebody's party that you didn't even know? She didn't even know Ethel. How could she have known if she wasn't going to like Ethel or not? 
Maybe she'd heard things that she didn't like. But you don't know her. You've never hardly even met her. So don't go on everybody else's word. I don't know. I, I That is a bad look on Jackie. What do we think? Okay, anyway, to continue. Ethel's St. Patrick's Day party set the tone for the chilly relationship that she and Jackie would have over the years. It was readily apparent to everyone present that the two had little affinity, let alone affection for each other. The gulf between them would widen even more after Jackie married into the Kennedy family that fall. Jack and Jackie had met while she was working as the inquiring photographer at the Washington Times Herald on the rebound from a broken engagement. That's not quite the truth. She broke off that engagement because she met Jack. But anyway. By the time of Ethel's party, Jackie had decided that she wanted to marry Jack, despite warnings about his womanizing from Lem Billings and others. But Jackie didn't care. She wasn't sexually attracted to men unless they were dangerous, like her father, a Kennedy family friend observed. It was one of those terrible Freudian situations. In the weeks and months that followed Ethel's party, the Kennedy gang got together on Saturday afternoons to play touch football at the Georgetown Recreation Center, a few blocks from Ethel and Bobby's place. Jack brought Jackie, who played half-heartedly. For the most part, she sat glumly on the sidelines and watched while Ethel roughed it up with the men. Jackie eventually put her foot down, refusing to play after breaking an ankle. Ethel made jokes that Jackie couldn't play because she was afraid to smear her makeup, one of the female players recalled. I remember Ethel, who rarely wore lipstick, shaking her head in wonderment, saying, Jackie thinks she's a queen. I can't figure out what Jack sees in her. When Jackie made her first visit to Hyannisport that summer, Ethel, who was also there, used the occasion to make fun of her blatantly, referring to Jackie as the debutante. Ethel mocked Jackie's trademark breathy voice and drew guffaws from her Kennedy sisters-in-law by noting that Jackie pronounced her name as Jacqueline, which, Ethel howled, rhymed with queen. The girls were in stitches when, during a conversation about their goals in life, Jackie mentioned that she'd once dreamed of being a ballet dancer. Staring wide-eyed at Jackie's slender size 11 feet, Ethel muttered, With those clod hoppers of yours, you'd be better off going in for soccer. On another occasion, Ethel commented to Jean about Jackie. I don't think she has blood in her veins. See, so, you know, Jackie might have been cold as a fish. But Ethel's kind of annoying. You know, it's like, if Jackie's different from you, okay, whatever. Then you can be the shining star on the touch football field. You don't need Jackie here, you know. But she's just pointing out all of Jackie's faults because she wants to improve her own standing in the Kennedy family. Like, oh yeah, well, Jackie might be so glamorous. He goes, I think Jackie's so glamorous, but who's willing to be out there playing? You know, Jack, stupid Jackie over there worried about smearing her makeup. Nothing but a queen, nothing but a debutante. She's the worst. Not, not a good look, Ethel. Just be you, do you, don't worry. You guys can be completely separate and you can be the queens of your own domains, but you don't need to care if she's not like you and you don't need to care if you're not like her. Just be you. Anyway, for her part, Jackie considered Jack's sisters and Ethel to be crude and boorish. I'm not going to be what they want me to be. She later told a friend, I won't cut my hair. I won't have 25 kids. She would later refer to Ethel as a baby-making machine, wind her up, and she becomes pregnant. Jackie later confided her dislike of Ethel to her friend Truman Capote, who wasn't fond of her himself. Ethel Kennedy has a mindset of a vulture, Capote once declared. She's the most highly competitive and insanely jealous human being I've ever met. Jackie would give a party, and a week later Ethel felt obligated to throw a shindig. She's obsessed by Jackie. Anything Jackie did, she could do better. To Ethel, Jackie was an alien from another planet. But in many ways, the two women were very much alike. Rich, spoiled, and, as time would prove, ill-starred. Jackie was born on July 28, 1929, 15 months after Ethel, in Southampton, a wealthy resort town, a zigzag across Long Island Sound from Greenwich. Her mother, vivacious, social-climbing Janet Lee Bouvier, was the daughter of another self-made millionaire in the mold of George Skakel and Joe Kennedy. Jackie's stockbroker father, John Verneau, Jack Black Bouvier, was a handsome rogue of 38, 16 years his wife's senior when he married her. Unlike the sexually naive and religiously repressed Ethel, the precocious Jackie enjoyed shocking her friends with stories about her father's sexual exploits. Unlike Ethel, Jackie was a child of divorce. Her mother had left Bouvier to marry another wealthy man, to Ethel. Divorce was anathema. And while Ethel, the virgin, was still being properly courted by Bobby, Jackie had already spent a year alone in Paris and been dubbed Queen Deb of the Year by New York columnist Charlie Knickerbocker and one Vogue's sought-after Prix de Paris. Ethel and Jackie could never be friends, one family member observed. Never. And a month after her St. Patrick's Day party, Ethel became pregnant for the third time. The following month, Jack asked for Jackie's hand in marriage, but the details were tabled until the Saturday Evening Post published a story about the Senate's gay young bachelor. 
Once the magazine hit the stands, the wedding plans became public. The wedding, with some 800 guests present at the church and 1,200 at the reception, was held on September 12, 1953, with Bobby as best man and Ethel as one of the bridesmaids. The ceremony was presided over by then Archbishop Cushing, who read a special blessing from the Pope. That night, Jack and Jackie went into New York, spending their wedding night in the Waldorf Astoria's honeymoon suite before flying off for a Mexican honeymoon. On their return, they rented a two-bedroom house in Georgetown, within walking distance of Ethel and Bobby's. Jack's choice of location, not Jackie's. To keep peace, though, Jackie accepted a loan of drapes and slipcovers from Ethel, even though the two women had completely different tastes. Jackie, said a relative, felt Ethel had no class, no finishing. By the time Jack and Jackie had bought their first home near 33rd and N Streets, about a block from Bobby and Ethel's recent O Street rental, Ethel had come to admire Jackie's skills as the first lady of the household, describing her sister-in-law's place as heaven and so supremely well-organized. I always get depressed coming back to my madhouse. Ethel wasn't exaggerating. As Skakel family friend Mary Begley observed, if you walked into one Skakel house, you would walk into all of them. Servants running around, no meals on the table, crazy, undisciplined. Ethel's house may have been a little grander, a few more servants, but it was all about the same. Jackie devilishly documented on canvas what she saw as her sister-in-law's disorganization. Her painting showed children running wild, servants coming and going, and the house in a general state of disarray. Like a badge of honor, Ethel proudly hung the painting in a prominent spot in her very disorganized home. That's where we have to end. Oh, I keep going right way against, way past the time I say I'm going to. My poor family. It's going to be bagels and cream cheese this morning. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Uh, but thank you so much for sitting with me and for reading with me. And I hope you guys are enjoying this so much. If you were one of the people who recommended this book to me, will you come say hi to me in the comments? Because I really want to give you so much thanks. I know that I talked to at least one person in the comments when they said, oh, you know, you should read this book. And I was like, thanks, I, I'll look it up. Thank you so, so very much. So please say hey to me in the comments so I can give you a real thanks for bringing this book to our attention. I am loving it. Okay, see you guys later. Bye.